Good morning. Can we stand and give him our best praise this morning? He's worthy. Amen. I'm praising on the battlefield. I'm singing through the pain. My God, you have to live in me. And I know you will again. So why would I worry? What should I fear? I know you're for me forever with me. You don't stop, won't stop, I don't go big. No doubt I'll see that big to me. You don't stop, won't stop, I don't go big. You're on my side. You're on my side. There is not an enemy I cannot overcome. So I will walk with confidence. The war's already won.
reminded, God, that the very breath in our lungs is yours. God, that each day you wake us up is a blessing. God, each day may we recognize just the, the gifts that you've given us, God. God, and that we could use our breath in our lungs to praise you, to glorify you, God. To tell somebody about your son, Jesus. God, in these next few moments, God, I pray that you just continue to stir. God, in these next few moments, remind us of the gifts that you've given us. The breath in our lungs, God, that we can share the good news about God. God, we just want to give you all the glory. We want to give you all the praise. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, I hope that since you entered the parking lot and even into the sanctuary that you felt welcome today, um, that you've experienced God's presence and connected with him. Um, and I just want to tell you that we are so glad that you're here. Um, my name is Jordan Cunningham, and I am the internship director here at Connection Point Church. So if you're not sure what the internship program is, um, it's actually a new ministry that we've started. It's called Connection Point Leadership College, or CPLC for short. Um, we've got a booth right out in the lobby, and so I've got some information out there about what our program looks like, what it entails, um, what our schedule is. Um, and so we are starting very, very soon. August 16th is our first day of the internship, um, but we are still accepting applications through Tuesday, August 9th. So this upcoming Tuesday is the deadline for applications, and you can find those on our website. Um, we have a CPLC tab that you can visit and get more information. Um, so before I or before we introduce our guest speaker today, I'm just going to go into a time of giving. Um, so at Connection Point Church, we value generosity, and so we make giving really, really easy. So we've got on this slide um, three different ways for you to give. So you can text the amount to 84321. You can give online at yourcbc.church slash give. Or you can give in the drop boxes at the back of the sanctuary or mail your check to 358 East Deerwood Drive in Jackson, Missouri. Um, so if you'll just bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray. God, we just love you so much. And we thank you for each and every person here today, Lord. We thank you for their generosity, for their, their obedience to give, God. I just thank you for everything that we've been able to accomplish, the way we've been able to touch our community um, and just expand our ministries here, God, because of the people's generosity. I just thank you for that. I pray that you would help us to be good stewards. Um, I pray that you would bless the rest of the service and our speaker. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, CPC family, it's August, and you know, in the month of August, we're launching our new leadership college, and it's going to be amazing. Now, in the process of developing this leadership college, we developed a partnership with Evangel University where those going through our internship program can actually get college credit with Evangel, and then any congregational member in our church can also get discounts on tuition with Evangel. It's a great opportunity if you want further your education. In that partnership, we got to know Mark Fabian, and Mark is an incredible man of God, loves the Lord, loves the scriptures, and I am honored that today our special guest is Mark Fabian. He's going to come now and share the word with you. So hey, as he comes on stage, get up on those feet, put those hands together. We do this every week. Come on. Let's welcome him with a big CPC welcome. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It is a joy and a privilege to be here. Hey, uh, if you don't mind, would you guys stand as we look to God's Word this morning? We're going to be reading from 1 Peter, the letter of 1 Peter in the New Testament. So if you've got a copy of the Scriptures with you or uh, an app that you can use, please turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to start reading in verse 11. I'm reading from the uh, ESV uh, version this morning. Uh, starting with verse 11, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Are you there? Everybody say amen. amen. All right, thank you. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, 
they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious." For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we acknowledge this morning, God, this is the eternal and true word of God. It is living and active. It is God-breathed. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning you would tune our hearts and our ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us this morning. And God, please, by your grace and with the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but God, help us to be doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. In November of 1970, the Oregon Department of Transportation was called in to deal with a big problem. The carcass of a dead whale had washed up on the beach, and it was a 45-foot, 8-ton rotting animal on the beach. Now, maybe you have uh, seen the video of this. Uh, this was one of those early viral videos on YouTube. So if you can imagine uh, Charlie built my finger and exploding whale, this was uh, one of those. The Department of Transportation had the idea to use a controlled explosion to break up the carcass of the whale, hopefully send it back out into the ocean. Uh, it did not go as planned. They packed half a ton of dynamite underneath the body of this whale, and when it went off, it did not do what they wanted. It threw chunks of that carcass, that rotting carcass, over a half-mile radius. If you watch the video, and if you haven't, you really should, but uh, there's a reporter by the name of Paul Lindman that uh, his commentary was this, the blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. <laughs> That's good reporting right there. Right? Uh, it did not go as planned. It was a lesson, in fact, in what not to do. Uh, following that blunder, the Department of Transportation no longer used controlled explosions to get rid of a, a whale carcass. 
We're looking today at a passage from Peter's first epistle. This is a general epistle, which simply means it's not written to a specific church or an individual. Uh, at the time of writing, Peter was an old man. I'm sorry, an elder. And the audience that he was addressing was living throughout the region that is today Turkey. And in those days, it was called Asia Minor. Peter's audience had embraced the good news of the gospel and they had experienced transformation. They had come out of the pagan idolatry and the immorality of their culture. But rather than being commended for this change, they became the target of pressure and persecution. Their faith in Jesus had made them outsiders in their own towns and homes. The hope that they had embraced came with an unexpected companion, it was trials and suffering. And so they felt this pressure to abandon their faith so as to have acceptance from society. So Peter's epistle gives practical guidance for enduring these kinds of social pressures and hostility. We don't need to give up, we don't need to give in, neither do we need to disengage entirely from society. So this morning, as we look again at 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to look again at verses 11 and 12, I want to talk to you about obstacles and opportunities. Obstacles and opportunities. The obstacles are not the external challenges we face, but the avoidable obstacles that we create for ourselves. It's the stuff inside that trips us up or else immobilizes us altogether. I'm talking about the obstacles of insecurity and fear, frustration, jealousy and anger. I'm talking about those internal conversations that paralyze your faith or else justify sin. And just to be clear, we all have obstacles. We all have these obstacles. And the opportunities I'm talking about are not to get rich quick or to make a name for yourself. I'm talking about the opportunities that are right in front of you. They're embedded into your daily routine. They have the potential to make a difference for eternity. I'm talking about the opportunities that we all have every day to change people's minds about the gospel. We all have them. They're right in front of us. So let's look again at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Peter starts this by calling his audience beloved. It's a term of endearment that is only used twice in this letter. The other place that is used is in chapter 4, verse 12, where Peter warns his audience of the fiery trials that are coming, that that's the new norm for what they're going to face. I kind of think of it maybe like Peter's trying to soften the blow here a little bit. Uh, we have two teenage daughters, so when they come to me and say, Daddy, I love you. <laughs> Dads, you know what that means, right? Hold on to your wallet, right? You got to watch out. There would seem to be a dissonance between the beloved status, the, what Peter calls them, this beloved status, and the hardship that he is warning about here in this passage and again in chapter 4. I think this is a subtle reminder that we are dearly loved despite the hostility of our circumstances. We have to be careful not to measure God's love by our circumstances and the situations that we're in. If we do that, that's a recipe for insecurity. God loves to bless and heal and provide and protect for his children. But listen, he loves us no less when we experience tragedy and loss. And we have to look at the life of Jesus himself as a case study for that point, right? The one who is dearly loved, the only begotten son, and look at what he suffered and what he endured. Peter reminds his audience of their new identity in Christ. Earlier in this letter, he's already explained their identity as living stones. They are God's dwelling. They are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The point is this, our new identity in Christ has transformed the relationship 
that we have with the world. You cannot enter into the kingdom of God without leaving the kingdom of this world. There's no dual citizenship in this arrangement. It's one or the other. So Peter calls them sojourners and exiles. They're outsiders. They don't quite belong the way they used to. He uses words here that paint the picture of a temporary resident, someone who lives in one place but belongs somewhere else. And that's not necessarily an antagonistic relationship, right? So we can go to a different culture or a different country, or hey, I can even come to a different side of the state. And we can enjoy being in that different part. We don't have necessarily have to have a hostile relationship as a sojourner or an exile. So I think what makes a good sojourner or exile? How do we do that well? In the Old Testament, there's a lot of examples. And I think of the example from the book of Daniel. You've got Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as they're more commonly known, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were just young men when they were taken from Jerusalem and put into the service of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. They became Babylonian officials, but they never forgot who they were. They served the king with loyalty and diligence, but they would not compromise their faith nor neglect their devotion. And God used them to demonstrate his wisdom and power. In fact, they brought about cultural change in Babylon. And it wasn't through resistance or insurrection, but through loyal and diligent service, faithfully, faithful to and fully reliant on God for his power and wisdom. So what makes a good sojourner or exile? Well, how about the example of Jesus? Scripture says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus was a sojourner. He was an exile. He was an outsider. And because we belong to Jesus, we are sojourners and exiles with him. So having recalled their status, their beloved, their sojourners and their exiles, Peter tells them first what not to do. He identifies for them an avoidable obstacle. He says simply, abstain from the passions of the flesh. Abstain from the passions of the flesh. He says something similar in the first chapter of this same letter. In uh, chapter 1, verse 14, he says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions, same word, of your former ignorance. And it's the same pattern here. It's an appeal to who they are, the transformation that they've experienced as a basis for the instruction that he offers. Now, I think about this. I, you know, often we talk about passion as a good thing, right? I'll tell you, as, a, as an educator at Evangel University, I am passionate about Christ-centered teaching and learning. I am passionate about raising up this next generation that will expand the carry the kingdom of of God into new places and new fields that's a passion of mine and I'm sure if you guys you have your own passions I'm sure that there is a hobby or a topic that gets you all fired up all right there's something that you are passionate about and um, that's not a bad thing in fact that's not what Peter is telling us here he doesn't want us to be passionless drones okay what he's talking about are, is the internal thoughts and desires of the unregenerate person, the person who does not know and does not follow Jesus. It's the ignorant mind, the corrupt conscious, the crooked moral compass, the self-serving interests and survivalist mentality that motivate all kinds of lust and jealousy and greed and selfishness and abuse and addiction. That's what Peter's talking about. It's this corrupt operating system of the people who are lost and broken, bound by sin, captive to the devil's destructive schemes. This is why hurt people hurt people, right? We all have this malware running in the background. It's hardwired into these bodies, this is, and this is what we have been saved from. This is, in fact, what has been put to death in Christ. We've been delivered from it. We can abstain because 
we have been set free in Christ. This is a good thing. This is a good command that Peter gives us. And yet today, as we think about these passions of the flesh, as Peter talks about them, today in our culture, they've been given a new and protected status, right? Every day we see dysfunction normalized and even celebrated in our culture. And the sad reality is that our kids are the target of a lot of those messages. Today, base and animalistic uh, desires are unchallenged. In fact, the weirder the better. According to our culture, whatever bizarre inclination you can entertain, you should pursue it without question or critique. That's a dangerous philosophy right there. Peter warns us about abstaining from the passions of the flesh, but he tells us why we need to abstain. He says the passions of the flesh, they are going to wage war against your soul. This is an internal and militant fight, an organized and strategic assault. Given the opportunity, fleshly passions will take over your life and they will lead to ruin. Not because of the prejudice of society, but because the wages of sin is death. Peter tells us that this militant attack, it's, it's, a, it's on your soul. He's talking about your life in Christ, the person who has been made whole. And Jesus talks about the soul in the same way. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So let me ask you, how is your soul? Is it under siege? As you think about your life as a whole, as a spiritual, relational, material being, how are you doing? Are you weary? Are you downcast? Are you distressed? We're in good company because the psalmists all use those phrases to describe their souls. If you read through the book of Psalms, you'll see places where people experienced that. Peter tells us to abstain for the sake of your soul. Stop it. Don't do that. Don't play that game. This is an avoidable obstacle. There are enough soul-sucking trials in life. Don't pour gasoline on that fire. Don't pack half a ton of dynamite underneath that dead whale. You're just going to make a bigger mess for yourself. When we abstain, when we learn this principle, we express our temporary residence. We're, we're abstaining from what everybody else is doing. And our weary soul is renewed. The downcast soul soars on wings like the eagle. The distressed soul is comforted and strengthened. Again, this is all stuff that the psalmists talk about while God renews their soul, their soul. This is how we endure. This is how we persevere. This is how we overcome. So Peter recalls their status as exiles. He tells them what not to do and why. And then he caps off these verses by telling us what to do, what actions that we need to take. Peter here is identifying for us a strategic opportunity. Now, he anticipates hostility from unbelievers. He's been around long enough to know how this works. He says, they will speak evil of you. He makes that assumption, when they speak evil of you. He knows that because he saw that in the example of Jesus. He saw them accuse and betray Jesus. Uh, earlier in the same chapter, Chapter 2, verse 4, he referred to Jesus as the living stone that was rejected by men, but in the sight of God is chosen and precious. So in response to this hostility, the, the speaking evil of you, Peter tells them to fight back with honorable conduct. Seems like a strange weapon to fight back with. And what is stated here in, chap in verse 12 is then applied to various scenarios in the rest of the passage that we're looking at this morning. Peter's convinced that honorable conduct can change the mind of unbelievers. 
There are opportunities embedded in our everyday routines at, at home, at work, and in our community. People can go from speaking against you as an evildoer to glorifying God in the end. That's a full 180 degree turnaround, right? So how does this work? What's the key in this? The key word in this whole passage is honor. You look through that passage, you'll see it repeated over and over again, honorable conduct and asking, uh, showing honor, being honorable. So it's, it's, the, it's the theme throughout this whole thing. So what is honor? The Greek word for honor is timē. It literally means a heaviness or a weightiness. Uh, if you're familiar with the orchestra, the big drum in the orchestra is called a timpani, a heavy sound, timpani. Uh, are there any Timothys in the house? Anybody named Timothy here? Timē theos means one who honors God. That's what the name means. But we understand honor as worth, respect, recognition. You could probably think of some instances when you were honored. Maybe you had a, a birthday party or a graduation, uh, something, some kind of special recognition at work, right? You understand what that, what that feels like, what that experience is like. It's always positive, right? Just a few weeks ago, we, uh, we had a, a celebration uh, with our family up in Ohio. My parents are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this year. And so we came together with our families to honor my parents, to, to recognize their faithful commitment and the investment that they have had in our lives. And it was, a, it was a great experience. It was a great experience for them. Listen, no one's ever inconvenienced or annoyed when you show them honor. It's always a positive experience. Honor is powerful. And Peter shows us how, the, how to harness that power to redeem and restore people in broken human systems and relationships. So what Peter has stated here as the general principle in verses 11 and 12, he then applies to specific contexts in the rest of this passage. So beginning in chapter 2, verse 13, he addresses the citizens or subjects of Rome. This is the social or political context. And specifically, Peter is addressing how we relate to public servants, civil authority, and state officials. He addresses servants beginning in 2.18. This would be the area of trade and commerce. This is the relationships between employees and employer, between buyer and seller, between borrower and lender, and so on. And then he addresses wives in chapter 3, verse 1, and then husbands in chapter 3, verse 7. So this is the family, and by extension, the community of faith. For each of these contexts, the, the principle is the same. Peter has a message for his audience. It's a message for us this morning, and it is this. Honorable conduct can influence and make a, an impact in each area. In our public institutions, in our workplaces, and in our homes. In contexts where we are otherwise powerless, in coping with hardship, in dealing with unfairness, honorable conduct is a powerful agent of change. So here's what we can learn about honorable conduct from this passage. First of all, honorable conduct resonates the gospel message. It resonates the gospel message. Do you know what a resonator is? Uh, a, uh, an acoustic guitar, like the one that's up here on the stage, is a resonator. The body of it is a resonator. It takes the vibrations from the strings and those vibrations and the sound waves, they bounce around within the body of that guitar. And in doing so, they are amplified so that the sound that comes out of that guitar is fuller and louder than the strings could produce on their own. That's what a resonator does. Did you know there's a resonator that's built into the human body? In the back of your throat is a resonator. It takes the vibrations of your vocal cords and does the same thing. It amplifies those vocal cords so that we can project a sound when we speak or sing or scream, whatever you might want to do. Here's another lesson in resonance. Have you ever had a vehicle that got stuck in the snow or mud? What do you do to get it out? You start rocking it, right? So you don't have enough force to just shove it free when it's stuck. But the application of a relatively small force 
at the right intervals amplifies the motion until you've built up enough momentum to free it from the mud or snow, right? That's, that's resonance. That's, that's what re a resonator does. So Peter is saying that when we, honorable conduct, when we show honor, it is actually resonates the gospel message. It, it, is, it is taking that gospel message and it's amplifying it and it's giving it power so that it can be heard by deaf ears and break through hard hearts. That's what he's saying about the power of honorable conduct. Secondly, he says honorable conduct aligns with God's will. In uh, chapter 2, verse 15, he says that this is the will of God. And we should say that the will of God is always good. It's not always easy, not always comfortable, not always convenient, right? But it is always good. In fact, it is always what is best for us. Honorable conduct silences ignorant foolishness. Boy, I love this one. <laughs> In the Greco-Roman world of Peter's day, Christianity was viewed as dangerous and evil. Oh wait, that, that's today too, right? That's kind of what we're facing in our world today. There's a lot of fear and anger and hatred out there and we see it all over social media. As in Peter's day, there are those who speak against the gospel of Jesus Christ as something evil. Honorable conduct has the power to put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And it's not through arguing back with them or striking back. I think of this, uh, this principle here, I think of it as like a mic drop moment. It's like all those times in the gospel when Jesus has some zinger and his opponents have nothing else that they can say to him. Boy, you gotta love that, right? And I think, wow, what would it take to silence the the ignorant foolishness of our culture, of those who speak evil of the gospel. Peter's given us the key for it right here. Honorable conduct demonstrates grace. Peter, in his appeal to servants, instructs them, be subject to their masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. The term that he uses to describe these evil masters here is scolios, as in the, the condition scoliosis, the twisted spine. It actually means crooked or twisted. Now, Peter is not ignoring the unfairness or the un injustice of their situation. Why doesn't he tell them, you need to, these slaves, if you're, if you're working for somebody who's unjust, unfair, this crooked master, well, you need to escape or you need to protest or you need to burn that whole system down. Well, here's the thing. Peter is not interested in reforming a system. He's interested in transforming people's hearts. And that needs to be our focus as well. If you fight evil with evil, all you get is more evil. You overcome evil with good. If you endure suffering for doing what is right, that is doing honorable conduct, Peter says it's a gracious thing. Here's how that works. When you act with honor even towards those who are dishonorable, you are giving people something that they do not deserve. And that's the definition of grace, right? You're giving them something that they don't deserve. When you have no power to reform the situation, nothing else to offer, you can still show grace through honorable conduct. And that actually gives you the upper hand. It is a powerful force. Peter says that honorable conduct imitates Christ. In chapter 2, verse 21, he says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. Peter's weaving the language of Isaiah chapter 53 throughout this passage. It describes how and why Jesus suffered. Jesus overcame sin and death. He defeated the devil. He opened the gate to God's kingdom by honorably enduring unjust suffering. And that is in fact why he has been given the name that is above every name. He's at the right hand of God. He's been exalted. Honorable conduct, even while endure, enduring unfair treatment, is imitating Jesus. It's following right in his steps. 
It's the example that he set for us. Honorable conduct is winsome and persuasive. Uh, Peter's appeal to wives that starts in chapter 3, verse 1, follows the same pattern of the previous appeals. He says, be subject to your own husbands. Why? Because the character and conduct of the believing wife can win over the unbelieving husband even without a word. Isn't that amazing? So, is Peter ignoring the inequitable status of women in the Greco-Roman world? No. (laughs) He's giving them the key to effect change. Honorable conduct is winsome. It is attractive and appealing. It is powerfully influential. Peter says that honorable conduct is pleasing to God. Continuing in his appeal to wives, Peter contrasts outward adornments with the inward character. He says a gentle and quiet spirit. It's the same word that Jesus uses in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5 when he says, blessed are the meek or the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Honorable conduct is very precious in God's sight. Honorable conduct is the evidence of our hope. Peter refers to the matriarchs in chapter 3, verse 5. These are the holy women of the Old Testament. They hoped in God and submitted to their husbands. Interestingly, Peter uses Sarah, Abraham's wife, as the prime example. Uh, In fact, the only time that Sarah calls Abraham Lord in the Old Testament is Genesis chapter 18, verse 2. And in that passage, Sarah is laughing at the notion that she would bear a son because she is worn out and her Lord, Abraham, is too old. So we can extend honor and worth and dignity in such simple ways. Our hope is not in social programs or political parties. We have a living hope, a living hope because of of Christ's resurrection from the dead. And we demonstrate that hope through simple acts that extend dignity, honor, and worth to other people. Honorable conduct recognizes the equity of grace. In uh, chapter 3, verse 7, where Peter starts his address to husbands, and here the pattern changes a little bit. In all the other appeals, Peter addresses people who would have been in a more socially disadvantaged role. So he talks to the subjects and citizens of Rome, He talks to the servants and then to the wives, but now he addresses husbands. The people in those other positions, they didn't really have the power to affect change given their role, or did they? I hope you're starting to see that the the power of honorable conduct gave them a tool to affect change even when they didn't have the natural authority to do so. Husbands in the Greco-Roman world, they would have had prestige and a place of authority within their own households. And Peter here tells them to honor their wives, not because they're physically stronger. In fact, Peter makes the point here because they are weaker. So he's making a general statement here. Men and women are different. And generally speaking, most men are physically stronger than most women. That's the point he's making. But he tells them to honor your wives as fellow heirs of the grace of life. See, the grace of God is the great equalizer. It's it's just as what the Apostle Paul says, that there is no more male or female, no more slave or free, no more Jew or Gentile. We are all one in Christ. So husbands, honor your wives, recognizing their equal status in Christ, or else it will hinder your prayers. That's, That's pretty serious business right there from what Peter is saying. Peter's command here directly applies to the family, but I think we can make the broader point and apply it to the, the, uh, the, the community of faith. We can honor one another as fellow heirs of the grace of God. Now, Peter points to Jesus as the source and supply of honorable conduct. Here's what how it works. We can show honor, not just because we're good people, not because we got our act together. We show honor because we have received honor. Jesus is the source and supply. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter's talking about Jesus. He says, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. 
See, it all comes back to Jesus. Honorable conduct does not start with us. It, in fact, starts with Jesus. He's the one that took our sin and shame, and he died for us. He has honored us. He invited us to the banquet. He gives us the seat of honor right next to him. He calls us up on the stage, and all of heaven stands in thunderous applause. He welcomes us in. He calls us his own. He clothes us with royal clothes. He puts a a crown on our heads. He calls us his own people. He's not ashamed to be called our God. He pours out his spirit on us, and he welcomes us into his family. He lavishes his love on us. He says, you are mine. He says, what is mine is yours. He says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened. See, when we understand the honor that we've been given, how Jesus has honored us, we can start to dislodge the dishonorable thoughts and actions from our hearts, the passions of the flesh. And we're set free. We can abstain from the passions of the flesh and then we are free to live honorably. When you see it this way, when we see it as a response to what Christ has done for us, living honorably, acting honorably, it's not an obligation, it's a privilege. It's not something that's a burden for us. It is, in fact, a gift and a blessing. So I want to give you some action steps as we conclude this morning. First and foremost, we have to embrace the honor that comes to us through Jesus. We have to embrace what he has done for us. If we don't, we'll never be tapped into that source and supply. We'll be left stuck in the pattern of our fleshly passions that drive us to dysfunction and to ruin. We have to embrace the the honor that Christ has given So I want to give an opportunity this morning, and I'm going to ask you all, if you would, just bow your heads in respect to this moment. I believe that God's speaking to hearts here this morning. I believe in that description I just gave of what Christ is doing, what he is, the honor that he's given. I think there's probably some people you're trying right now to disqualify or talk yourself out of that. Say, no, God doesn't know what I've done. That doesn't apply to me. God would never honor me that way. And I want to tell you, this is for everyone, every one of us. No one has sinned too much or gone too far. God gave his son to take all of your failures, all of your hurts, all of your pain, and put it to death. And then Jesus rose from the dead so that you can have new life, a right relationship with God, and the hope of eternity. He wants to honor you. He died to honor you. He lives to honor you. If you'll only open up your heart to receive what God has for you today. So I want to give an invitation. If that's you today and you're thinking about your life, you recognize that you have not embraced this honor that Jesus has for you. You've been resisting it. You've talked yourself out of it time and time again. Then right now I'm going to ask you just to lift your hand. Lift your hand and say, that's me. I need to receive that this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to wait just a moment more. And raise your hand and say, that's me. I need to receive that honor that God has for me today. And I want you to pray a prayer, just something just like this. Say, Jesus, I believe that you died to free me from sin, guilt, and shame I believe that you rose from the dead to honor me with new life and a clean start and a right relationship with God. I believe that you are the risen Lord and Son of God. I embrace the honor that you freely give and I commit to following you. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer in your heart this morning, I want you to know you're in, a, you're in a church with people 
imperfect, we're messed up, we all got our own obstacles and stuff that we're dealing with, but we're, we're following Jesus, we're committed to following him. And I want you to know there's a connection team that would love to stand with you and to pray with you and to encourage you. They're up at the front here, they're going to be available after the service. You're, you're welcome to connect with them, there'll, there'll be some people out in the lobby as well where you can connect with but they want to walk this journey with you. They want to help you understand what God has done. They want to help you grow in the grace of God, and so do all of us. So I want to make that, that available to you. So first and foremost, this is for all of us. We all need to embrace that honor that comes to us in Christ. That is our source in supply. Secondly, we need to avoid the obstacles. You are free to abstain from the passions of the flesh. You can say no. You can stop. You can dodge those avoidable obstacles. Listen, you can delete that app off your phone. You can break that bad habit. You can turn off that show that's just a time waster and a discouragement. You can take the first step to addressing addiction in your life. You can resist the attack on your soul. So what obstacles are tripping you up? Is there fear, jealousy, depression, anxiety, anger, lust, insecurity. Take a stand. Be free. Be free to abstain in the powerful name of Jesus. Third, we need to find the high road. We, we avoid the obstacles, but we need to seize these opportunities to act honorably. Listen, you, you've been hurt. The situation is unfair. I get it. But there's an opportunity here. Do the next right thing. Go out of your way to show honor, dignity, and worth to someone. When you are otherwise powerless to affect any change, honorable conduct is powerfully influential. There are opportunities that you have today in your homes, this week in your workplaces and in our community to change people's minds and thereby redeem and transform our broken world. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. It is living and active. And Lord, we acknowledge the truth of what we've encountered today, God, what you've called us to what you are equipping us for. And so, God, I pray that freedom over everyone here this morning, every soul that feels under siege, God, I declare from the truth of God's word, I declare in faith and in power freedom, freedom for those who feel that they are under siege, God, freedom from the passions of the flesh that wage war against their souls. Lord, I pray that today would be a day where you free those who feel bound, God, where you change the minds of those who, who feel like they've just been stuck. I pray that faith would arise, God, and your grace would be great. And Lord, we pray for the opportunities. They're right in front of us. They're there every day. God, help us to be people that show honor. God, not that answer evil with evil, but answer with good and blessing. Let this church, God, and this community have the reputation of being honorable, of acting honorably. Let in our homes, in our workplaces, in our community, God, let each individual here have that reputation. Boy, there's something different about them. They just react differently to the way the, the world. They don't, they don't answer back the way they, we thought they would. But God, that, they, that we are empowered to act honorably, even when we have nothing else to offer, nothing else to do. Nothing else that we can do in a situation. God, let that raise up within us. Let that be the character of, our, of us, God, of your people here in this church, that we would show honor. And God, that it would be something that transforms people's lives. Now, Lord, we pray it again. Help us not to just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Help us to put this truth to action in our lives. I pray your grace, your mercy, your power at work, every single one of every single person here. And we give you thanks. We give all the glory to Jesus. It's in his powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.